one. All right. Well, welcome. Thank you for coming this evening. Thank you to all those who are here in person. Thank you to those who are joining us online as well. We welcome you here this evening. Last week, uh, we covered uh, what Scripture teaches us about uh, free will. It was a pretty hefty discussion. It, um, I think there were some good questions. Feel free to go back into the workbook and, uh, and review stuff. You can also go back and watch the video. But um, we covered that the Scripture does not teach that God controls all of the behavior of free agents. And so the language that we used wasn't just in the language of human beings, but it was also uh, can be used in the, in the language of humans or, uh, or other things as well. Humans and angels seem to be able to make free decisions to some degree. And if that's true, then what we discussed and what we went over last week is that there's also an ability to grieve God's spirit and to some extent frustrate God's people. Now, I, I really have no problem concluding that God's knowledge is perfect, including his foreknowledge, while at the same time talking about the fact that we have been given freedom to exercise our personal will and make real decisions. And so the conclusion of last week was our decisions matter. If it's true that we've been given freedom and been led and directed into making the choices that are good and choices that are evil, then what we do in this life, how we use our words, how we use our time, it actually is very important, not only for the benefit of our families and ourselves, but also for the kingdom of God. In the first session, which was six weeks ago, which is wild, we talked about um, the third chapter of Genesis. And in this chapter, we're introduced to a new character. So if we're putting out a board, there's a new character that comes on board. And it slithers itself into the story and tries to inject its poison everywhere it goes. And it works toward fracturing the relationship between God and his creation. Now, as we follow the biblical record, the same character pops up time and time and time again. And sometimes it seems to be lurking behind the scenes, causing mayhem and trouble. And throughout scripture, this figure is shown to be an active participant in causing pain and suffering. So for several weeks, I think I've said, hey, this session is coming, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of questions that have been asked about this, and I think they're good questions. There are, uh, there are issues revolving, why does the world really look like this? Why is this going on? Why is this happening? And so I believe this is going to be, uh, it, it could potentially be a large pillar into the answer of theodicy, which is how do we make sense of the world that we live in while also openly confessing to who God really is? He is perfect. He is all powerful. He is all knowing. He is all present. But you turn on the news and you are tempted to conclude other things because of how nasty the world is. So, a couple of weeks ago, we covered the book of Job, right? And in Job, wasn't it interesting that we see the primary antagonist, the villain of the story, is Satan? We should note that throughout the entire story, the Lord never informs Job or his friends about Satan. Of all the answers that God ends up giving... The answer of, of the real problem, the one who's doing all this, is never given. The agent that was responsible for Job's misfortune is after the introduction, this being, Satan, is not mentioned again. Yet, we know that Satan was the one who was responsible from the very beginning of the story, even at the introduction, right? The Lord never gives Job an explanation of the origin of his suffering. So throughout the story and in the conclusion, Job is humbled by having his ignorance exposed and his arrogance defeated with humility, right? Does anyone have any questions about that? I mean, I know we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. I don't necessarily have a question, but what, well, I kind of do. Okay. You said uh, Jesus never told Job hmm. about Satan. Did 
I know Adam and Eve were told about the serpent, but was he given a name? Did they call his, their attention to um, Satan, the word Satan? Yeah, so uh, we'll get into the, the actual name of Satan and the devil. How he was introduced is just serpent. And so we don't actually, we're not actually going to find out that the serpent was the devil until Revelation, until the very end of the story. Do, are we actually connected that the serpent is actually the bad guy of the story, right? But it, he pops up time and time again. And so then in Job, the answer that God gives to Job to talk about his pain and his suffering, he was never, God was never answering the what or the how, God was answering the who, right? And so during that discussion, we concluded that his suffering, Job's suffering, is not God's fault, that God's not against him, that God's actually trustworthy. But we're also told a little bit more about Satan. And the story of Job suggests that things are going on. Hey, that's me. It just popped up. <laughs> if you miss, yeah, if anyone misses anything, you can always just go over there and, and turn it back. Yep. That's funny. I thought that sounded familiar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, the story of Job in this conversation that we're about to have suggests maybe that things are going on in the heavenly realm that we are completely ignorant of but that nevertheless affect our lives. That's the story of Job, right? Job never finds out to, to any degree that we know about the biblical record. But yet it was Satan who was the one who was enacting all the things against Job and his family and his land and his livestock, right? So if God encapsulates all things that are good and pure and righteous and holy, then this other character is going to be representing its opposite time and time again. So according to scripture, the head of the rebellion against God and his purposes and his people is a, a fallen being. And under this being are other fallen beings, as well as humans, who are refusing to submit to God's rule. Now, it's also clear, I'm going to give the end of the story here. It's clear that God's going to someday destroy completely this bad person, this bad being, and its forces. But until that day and time, God's kingdom, we genuinely wage war against the kingdom of darkness and its leader. Right? This leader is sometimes referred to as the adversary, the slanderer, devil, Satan, Lucifer, and we find in John chapter 10, verse 10, that this character's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. destroy, right? What we are talking about is called the cosmic conflict. So we'll look here at the top. Cosmic conflict is that all human suffering is not due to random chance or just the evil of fellow human beings. Rather, evil forces are working behind the scenes to cause destruction and pain. There's an unseen conflict being waged against humanity. So instead of blame, blaming an omnibenevolent God, what does omnibenevolent mean? All good. All good, all perfect, containing no fault. Instead of blaming this God, the cosmic conflict framework suggests that we point our anger and righteous disdain to workers of iniquity, including their leader, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Are there any questions so far before we jump in any deeper? I don't have a question, but what, I, what I'm thinking is, Absolutely. Because, you know, the Bible has a lot there for us, and I think he tells us that in his own way, that if we go to the scriptures and study them and go through them, that's 
our answer is right there. Because like with Job, I think he knew that Job could find the answers if he would just study and understand and seek the answers. Because that's mostly right now for us, we do have the Bible. And a lot of times we are actually blinded by what we're going through somewhat, I think. We're actually overwhelmed or blinded by the things that we're going through, the problem at the time, the loss or the mourning or whatever the problem is. Mm. But a lot of times we have to go through it, I think, to become stronger, but also at that time we're overwhelmed. But if we go through the scriptures, we can find answers after answers after answers if we just ask God to go for go because yeah, if, if you're waiting every week for the three hours on Sunday morning and one hour on Wednesday night to be your entire spiritual direction, mm-hmm. I think you're going to run into problems, mm-hmm. right? And so this series is going to end in, it's, it's a full nine-week series, but like I said, I think every week, this is not going to be a, a full discussion on all this stuff because eventually down the road, you're going to experience pain and suffering and an issue. So you can always look back to this, but this is really, in a lot of ways, this is the start, this is the starting gun for the topic. This is the starting gun for the conversation. So we're about to, to walk through cosmic conflict, right? What, what is Satan? What is the, what, what do demons play into all this conversation? What about angels? But we're gonna do this in an hour. And there are books on books on books that you can read about this, that are help, gonna help explain the Bible to you, because the Bible can be a very confusing book on a lot of very important topics. And so, um, as we dive back into this, this view, the cosmic conflict view, it's gonna argue that human suffering isn't due to random chance or just the evil of other people, but that there's an actual force that's, that's in play against us, working behind the scenes. And the harm from this war that's going on, it can be direct harm to an individual, or it can look like temptation, or it can look like addiction, or it can look like a bunch of other things, different avenues, different tools that the enemy might use. The harm doesn't have to be physical either. In the Bible, we see a lot of physical examples, but it can also be spiritual, mental, financial, relational, political, emotional, or any other oles that you can think of, any combination of these. As with the answer of free will, I believe God's purpose is deeply intertwined in love. It's not fear. I believe it's love. God created the world, us, to display love and to invite others to share in it. So as we talked about last week, maybe... For free creatures to be able to love and choose, that allows the possibility of war to break out in his creation. Maybe the possibility to love also contains the possibility to hurt others. I think we see that all the time. God obviously wants the former. He wants the love. But in order to achieve it, I think he also may have made way for the latter in allowing us the freedom to hurt people we unfortunately use that freedom to hurt people a lot, right? So it it assumes that the explanation for evil is in the free wills of people or creatures or agents, including Satan, falling angels, all these, not in God or random chance, okay? Yeah, yeah. So the cause of conflict framework that we point our anger to demonic workers of iniquity. Now, some who hold this framework, some who who are going to preach about this or talk about this, I just listened to a a string of sermons from different ministers from different schools of thought about this. Some are going to go as far as to blame everything, all evil and pain and every form of suffering on evil forces, including natural and moral evils, right? They're going to look at hurricanes, and t- tornadoes. <laughs> They're going to look at animal attacks, kidnapping, and terrorists as an extension of the chaos and destruction that these forces are unleashing. Right. So one of them is going to say. One of them says it seems reasonable 
to say that the New Testament wants us to understand that there is some degree of influence in nearly all wrongdoings and sin that occurs today. Not all sin is caused by Satan, but this evil behind-the-scenes activity may be a factor in almost all sin and all destructive activity that opposes the work of God in the world today. So if there is something that is in opposition to God's work, they're going to say that evil is behind it. It's not random chance. It's not just free will. It's not just that God has spun the wheel and whatever happens, happens. It's, there's actually another side of this. There's a force that's working against. So if the batteries in your remote controller die, you probably don't have to drive to church and cast the demons out of your remote, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. However... When we see a terrorist group that decides to bomb another hospital, the framework is going to suggest that there is someone pulling the strings. Temptation, maybe. You see that power? It's only one button away. It can be yours. That land can be yours. That water can be yours. Those people can be yours. Why aren't they yours already? This thing that influences, why is it? that power, protection, provision, and pleasure are at the root of almost every sin, at the root of almost all destruction and bad decisions, right? The world looks like a war zone because it is a war zone, not just in a nation across the pond, but in our families and in our hearts and in our lives. That's what this is going to suggest. Some look at evil that's even apparent in creation, natural disasters, cancer, animal attacks. They're going to blame this evil and the evil done by evil forces, right? And what they're doing, it's actually called the Lucifer principle, right? I'm not promoting it. I'm not suggesting it. But some people are going to look at all of this bad stuff. Any bad thing that a news broadcaster can say, they're going to say that you look at nature and it is red in tooth and claw dripping with the, the blood of the innocent, animals, vipers, poison, uh, natural disasters that seem to be working themselves into high populated areas. They're going to say that something is influencing that other than just random chance, weather patterns, and the natural instincts of animals. Okay. What do we think about that? Yeah, for some it's a little bit more tempting. I think it may be kind of too easy of an answer. It's not really what we get in Job, right? I'm pretty sure when Job was explaining this, he says that the world is beautiful, but it's not safe, mm -hmm. right? But we also see that in Jesus' ministry, it shows that when he was battling disease or infirmity, he did so as an all-out attack against Satan or some demonic influence time and time again. The Father's will, God's will, seems to be to get rid of all deformities, diseases, and illnesses. Right? The biggest of these we'll go over on the next page. But, I mean, look at Mark 9 or Luke 13. There was a woman that had been bound by Satan for 18 years. Those are the words of Jesus. Right? So we have to try to make sense of that. Before we go any deeper into this, there, there's a bit of a, uh, an issue with how we approach this today. Although the vast majority of Christians throughout all the ages have believed in a conflict between God and, and demonic agents, since modern day, specifically around enlightenment, we talked about this, where if you can't prove it, it doesn't exist. If you can't show me, then I won't believe it, right? This view has been dismissed or completely overlooked because people no longer believe in the supernatural. They don't believe in angels. They don't believe in demons, now, maybe some have a vague belief in it to some degree, but overall, they dismiss the very premise, so anything that comes from the premise is, is not going to hold weight to them. But it's interesting, if you really push them on that, what they'll come up with is usually, it usually doesn't make sense. For instance, I talked to a young adult, he said, I don't believe in miracles, I don't believe in the supernatural, but he believes in ghosts. Yeah. And I was like, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> Like, you have to explain that to me, yeah. right? So I, you know, I only believe in things that can be proven in a lab. And I'm like, okay, well, show me how to make justice in a, in a test tube, right? I, I don't think some of these views just don't line up. 
right? But it is interesting that in the past, evil was perceived as the source of suffering. But today, suffering that's not assumed to be the norm is perceived as evil. So because of the world that we live in, and to some degree our privilege and our protection, suffering is now the stumbling block. So if suffering happens, it used to be evil was causing suffering, so we will go to God. Now it's suffering is the evil, therefore God doesn't exist. Why would it? Why wouldn't he protect us? So throughout the majority of church history, it's no, 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 there's bad stuff that's going on. They're causing this. We battle this with God. Well, when you surrender the other side of this, then all you see is the suffering. And then it's really, it's not a very long jump to say that God is causing this or he didn't protect us or anything else like that, right? And so some people abandon their faith altogether because of their suffering. And yet, and yet we know and maybe some of us in here right now are here because of the amount of suffering that we went through. It solidified. It, it was like a fiery furnace. And every time we went through pain, it was like more coals being put in that furnace to refine us into the men and women of God that we are today. We know that there is a God and we want to prevent other people from going through suffering because of what we experienced. So some people, it'll break them and other people will make their entire ministries about them, Right? I mean, you think of grief share, his healing light ministries, you think of addiction ministries. Most addiction ministries start with people who were in a pretty bad way and they fought in tooth and nail to get themselves out of it by the grace of God and now they are trying to help other people, right? But any answer that focuses on the existence of the supernatural is quickly dismissed as impossible. So this is, a, it's a little bit of a, of a warning sign around this conversation that if you're talking to someone who's not a believer and you introduce this as the principle, it may create barriers to them. For us, it's not that big of a deal because we already believe in at least one non-human person who's active in history, and that's God, right? But just a little bit of a, of a caution. So um, does everyone know someone who doesn't believe in the supernatural to some degree, yeah. right? That used to not be a thing. And now it's, it's going to be hard in your workplace or stuff like that to not know someone uh, who holds that view. So it might be interesting to ask them why they hold that view. And it's going to be because you can't prove it or we can't see it, right? So it is an interesting conversation, right? So we'll keep moving on. The, the term cosmic conflict sometimes creates an issue based on the question, how can God possibly be in conflict, right? Which omni descriptor does this challenge? His power, his, his presence, his goodness, his knowledge, right? How can God possibly be in conflict with somebody else? So we've used that term several times and so i think it's important to explore it to some degree to say that god's in conflict with any force including satan or anything else it can question the depth of god's knowledge and power and that's going to seem a little inappropriate right so why can't god just destroy the enemy and win the conflict right has anyone ever asked that <laughs> right why doesn't god just win yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 cross the finish line please at any time yeah right so with this view of good and evil, when using the term conflict, it's not a conflict of strength. If you challenge God to an arm wrestling competition, he wins. Oh, yeah. it's, it's not a conflict of knowledge. If, if you're going to, yeah, you're going to you know, yeah. ask him to do a trivia contest, <laughs> like, he's all knowing. It's a conflict of character. That's the conflict. And here's what I mean. In both Genesis and the book of Job, which we explored, Satan tries to prove that God is a liar. It's a conflict of convincing us, of tempting us, that we know more or someone else knows more than God. It's... It's us, not God, that is allowing Satan to win and to have a foothold in our life. In Genesis, Satan distorts God's words 
to tempt Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. They fall to Satan's lie and they disobey God. It leads to their downfall, which is separation from God. They get kicked out of paradise. There are curses that are outlined in Genesis 3. Through temptation, lies, and deceit, Satan convinces humanity that he or we know best and that God doesn't have our best interest in mind when he places restrictions upon them. You can eat of any tree, whoosh, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There are so many things in our lives and in our bodies that we can do to give God glory to better further his kingdom. But the Bible also gives us restrictions on what we do in our body. Don't lie, cheat, and steal. Don't do that stuff, right? So Satan is going to use those things and say, well, why not? No one's going to know that you're lying. No one's going to know that you're stealing. No one's going to catch you if you cheat, right? Those are the kinds of things, and that's how Satan operates, right? He convinces us that we know best, that God doesn't have our best interest in mind. This was not about power. It's not about strength in pounds, but has always been a conflict of God's character. That's the thing that Satan attacks. Satan's not going to attack, he's not going to test his strength, right? In Job, Satan calls God a liar over the character of Job and his faithfulness. God, uh, Satan directly contradicts God's judgment of Job. So God allows Job to go through trials to prove that Satan's accusations are false and to disprove the slanderer of God's character. This is a character conflict, and because of that, it can't be settled by power. It, it can only be settled by demonstration. So what, I mean, just think about it like this. What kind of God would we serve if everything, if every time we questioned God, we got struck by lightning? So you would know, don't question God, right? I don't think that would make God a very good God. If any time his character is called into question, he beats people into submission, is that going to be a good father? Is that going to be a good ruler? Is that going to be an omnibenevolent God? I would doubt it, right? Satan doesn't just tempt humanity with evil works. He doesn't just tell us to steal. He doesn't just tell us to kill. He tempts to question and deny God, to deny God's character. And in a lot of ways, that, that's really the point of the nine-week series. Y yeah, we're, we're coming up with some answers and some pretty good ones, but regardless, the one answer we can't present ever is that God is anything less. That's how people really got in trouble in the book of Job. Right? Job, this is your fault, and then Job's going to blame God, right? And whatever, however we answer that, we can't go into that, right? So the cosmic conflict holds that Satan is the evil one, the villain of the story. And this is the second page. The villain of the story is revealed early on. We're not even out of the third chapter of the book of the Bible when the bad guy is introduced. The bad guy doesn't get defeated until the last book of the Bible in Revelation. And we haven't gotten there yet, right? So this, this villain pops up all throughout the story and is finally defeated once and for all at the conclusion of the story. Right? The serpent is the Bible's first portrayal of evil from this point on. Human rebellion is interwoven with spiritual rebellion time and time again. There isn't a single book of the Bible where this isn't the case. And it's going to go so far as sometimes in the Old Testament, evil kings are actually seen as being um, perpetrators in, in alliance with evil and in reliance with Satan. And that's how they get power or whatever else. And so devil, the devil isn't actually uh, his name, right? The, the devil's not the thing. Devil means slanderer. And we, we just covered why that's important. So when you say like the devil, it's, it's a title meaning slanderer. Satan is also not his name. It's from Hasatan, which means the accuser or the adversary, right? In Matthew 4, chapter 3, he's called the tempter. In Matthew 12, the ruler of the demons. Matthew 13, he's called the enemy, which is good. John 8, the father of lies. John 10, the thief. 2 Corinthians 4, a little correction here. That should be a lowercase g, because he is not big case g God. He is a little teeny, 
the God of this age, which is both interesting and devastating. As well as 1 John 5, 18, which is, calls him the evil one. Okay? So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, the, the God of this age. Paul shows that someone is at work to keep those who are perishing from those who are going through hurt. Someone is at work to keep them from coming to Christ. There's an actual being making an effort behind the scenes to keep people from being freed from their hurt and their pain. And Paul refers to this entity as the God of this world. So Paul is describing the work of Satan on earth, right? Now I'm going to list these off and we can discuss them if you want, but a very quick um, biblical overview. So if you want to make notes, you can make notes on the, the right side of this, um, this page in your booklet. But Luke chapter 13, verse 11 we kind of talked about that a little bit. Uh, sickness is caused by an evil spirit. And for 18 years, a woman who has uh, suffering has been bound. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, Jesus heals all who were oppressed by the devil. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 Satan is uh, communicated by Peter as prowling around like a lion seeking someone to devour. John chapter 13, verse 2 says that the devil put betrayal into the heart of Judas. And as Judas handed Jesus over, it says that Satan had officially entered into him. So Acts chapter 5, verse 3 says that Satan influenced Ananias' heart. Do we remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira? Right? So... Yeah. You know that story? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I read that one. Yeah. Right? So... It's her fault. When they, it's her fault. So when, when Ananias decided uh, to lie we see that God's power is still at work and that when he and his wife, Ananias and Sapphira, work to hurt the church, mm -hmm. then God corrects that behavior, mm -hmm. right? First yeah. Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18, it says that Satan actually hindered Paul's work. So, so Paul's trying to get stuff done and Satan comes along and to some degree... It and then he says he did it twice, didn't he? Yeah. No. First Thessalonians chapter two. First Thess two. Yeah. In the words of Jesus, uh, John I almost said Jesus chapter twelve. John chapter twelve said that the ruler of this world will be cast out. Right. So we're we're not in the book. This is all this is all free range. <laughs> uh, John twelve thirty one. Then again in John 14, 30, John 12, 31, and now we're in John 14, 30. The ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. The only time in scripture that this is used, and if I remember right, Paul actually had to make up a word for this. The prince of the power of the air the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. What was that? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. 1 John 5, 19. The whole world lies or is under the sway of the wicked one. I think it's actually in Ephesians that it says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and yeah, blood. Yeah, yeah this, that's the Ephesians passage. Yeah. For we do not wrestle against... That's Ephesians 6, 12, yeah. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against 
principalities, powers. against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, yeah. against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. places. Right? So, these, these authors, Jesus himself, Paul, Luke, John, they're not pulling punches as to what's going on here. It's being talked about as a real adversary. Someone who is working against the, the will of the one who is righteous. Someone who is actively at play, at work, against us and our families. Satan, as a created being, seems to have been granted some form of free will, and he used this to disobey and rebel against God. And upon this rebellion, Satan was cast out of heaven. He wanted to be worshipped. He was prideful, whatever other thing that you say. So his MO is very similar. While he's here, he's wanting to get the glory and the honor for himself. Right? Yeah. And so uh, Jesus, in answering in Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 18, it's kind of a fun answer, and it talks about who exactly Jesus is. But it says, The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Mm-hmm. So there's a couple of different stories as to how he fell. And I, I doubt it was in a bolt of lightning. But what it means, it was quick, fast, instantaneous. Yeah. He did something and fell from grace. And now... Even in the book of Job, do we remember? Where have you been, Satan? And he yeah. says, I have been going to and fro mm-hmm. to the ends of the earth. Right? So, so it's, not, it's not this absence, um, disconnected thing. When you see, like, cartoons and pictures of Satan, what do you typically see? Cartoons. Red. Yeah. Yeah. He's red. He's with red. Horns with horns. He has yeah. a tail. Sometimes it's fork. He's usually holding a, pix, a pitchfork. Yeah. Yeah. And his job is to do what? It's usually to punish people who are in hell. Right? That's usually, that's the typical thing. All of that comes from one passage in Revelation where he's called the dragon. Yeah. Right? He's not literally, the, yeah. he's not red. He doesn't have horns or a tail. Right? It's just an artist's rendition that this is obviously the bad guy of the story. Mm-hmm. A giant red creature with a tail and a, a pitchfork and mm-hmm. horns. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the, handle, the, the villain handlebar mustache. <laughs> yeah. On the shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think sometimes our imaginations are a little bit wild and sometimes that is oh, yeah. a human way of Describing things sometimes when we can't normally describe what we actually read or see in yeah. scriptures or whatever. Yeah, I think that's accurate. I think we have a we have a tendency to if we have a hard time making sense of something, then we, we put it into words. But um, that's not what we see in in the biblical record. Is that he he's not he does well, one he doesn't look like that. That's mostly comical. But he's not in hell poking people, right? <laughs> that doesn't seem to be his job description. His job description seems to be to hurt people who are here right now mm-hmm. and to sway them one way or another while they're making decisions, right? It almost seems like he's, I know he's not omnipresent, but it almost seems like he's just everywhere no. at the same time. Well, he has his, he has his yes. Empty demons here, workers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's seen as a kingdom. Yeah. Right? It's kingdom of light versus kingdom of darkness. Right. Right. Any? What other thoughts do we have? Any other thoughts from from down yonder? Any other thoughts before we keep jumping? Also called Beelzebub. Beelzebub. Right. I'm pretty sure that's the um, the father of flies. Or something like that. It's Lord of the Flies. Lord of the Flies. And, yeah. and the reason that that's given as a title is because what do flies hang around with? Dead stuff. Dead, gross yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah. All sorts of nasty stuff. So uh, 
I had debated whether or not to jump down this hole, but let's do it anyway. Has anyone ever heard him called Lucifer? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Lucifer, probably not his name either. So in Isaiah 14, the king of Babylon is called the shining one, the son of the dawn, the morning star. And this is definitely Isaiah who's kind of making fun of him. And he's paralleling the king of Babylon to a false god of the, of the culture who got kicked out of heaven because he, or he got kicked out because he was too small. And so Isaiah, it seems like he's, he's making fun of the king of Babylon. And so um, they were titles for a, a false Canaanite god. The Hebrew word, I think it's Halal, is literally translated shining one. And then when that was translated to Greek, it was Heosphoros, which means dawn bearer. And then Jerome, the early church father, translated this to Latin. And that's when we get the word Lucifer. So to call Satan Lucifer is what happens when they translate Hebrew to Greek in the Septuagint and then try to go from the Greek to Latin. Okay. Yeah. So all that being said, we recognize who and what we're talking about when we say these things. Right? We recognize we're talking about the bad guy. So it's not necessarily it's not necessary to go into like a full word study, but it is interesting. Uh, the Lucifer one's kind of a fun like use that the next time you're at a party, I guess. <laughs> but it is interesting when devil and Satan come up in, in the Bible and when those, those terms are used, right? Devil is associated with the slanderer. Satan is the accuser or an adversary to God's purpose, right? So not every use of the term Satan refers to the fallen angel. So when, when Jesus calls Peter that in Matthew 16 and in Mark 8, he's not saying Peter was possessed by the great fallen angel Lucifer, but in that moment, Peter was being an adversary to the work of God. Right? That's, that's what I think. That's what I believe. Other people might take a different approach, but... He says, get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Well, and that, so that to me brings about a, a rabbit trail, so to speak, on do it. the problem of evil. So here Jesus is praising him. Mm. Yep. That flesh and blood has not revealed to, to this to you, but the spirit of almighty God. And then, just a short time later, Satan shut up. Yeah. <laughs> get, get, get behind me. Yeah. Which means flesh doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily have to be activated by Satan to do stupid or wrong or evil things. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, so uh, it, you're going to be that approach is going to be kind of the middle of the cosmic conflict. So the other side is uh, Satan has no say in pretty much anything, that this is God's ordering all this. The middle ground would be that we have free will and we're making bad decisions. And when we do that, bad stuff happens. And the other side of this is every bad decision, every natural disaster was because of evil for some degree or another. What's the scripture when we're drawn away because of our own lust? Mm. You know what I'm talking about? Right. James, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I, I I think we have a balance between the cosmic conflict mm -hmm. and the free will. I think so too, and this is why uh, this is why I scheduled it like this because to talk about this before free will would have made it more confusing than I think it already is, <laughs> right? And so I think we have been given agency, we have been given the ability to choose, and I think it's still important that we choose what's right. But I think that we could maybe inadvertently be causing worse destruction than we know about when we make decisions that aren't parallel to what God has asked us to do, right? And not to mention that when Jesus was, was helping people who were sick, he was doing it, he, would, he drew his sword and attacked the kingdom of darkness, right? And he, he used his words and he used love and gentleness, but he said, Satan... Satan had her for 18 years, but not anymore, right? And when he's casting out demons, like they're going into pigs, right? And I, I didn't choose to go over it, but when there's a, a demon in a person, Jesus casts it out, he goes into the pigs and falls over, 
Like that's that's a very real representation of what's going on here, and that there are there are things that are trying to manipulate and sway what's happening in the favor of of destruction, right? So Satan is a created being, both personal and supernatural, it seems, and is identified in Scripture as the adversary of God and man. In the biblical witness, the, Satan is both a fallen angel and a hostile spiritual force. His primary work is deception, temptation, and destruction. So um, I think, Pastor Dan, you, you created a good parallel. Why would God create angels that are going to rebel and cause mayhem? Yeah. Right? Maybe it's the same as the free will defense, right? A world where these creatures have freedom is better than a world where they don't. Maybe, maybe the freedom to love and worship and pursue holiness is better than a world of even angelic robots. I don't know. It's, it's true of humans. Maybe it's true of the celestial beings. Uh, but whatever our answer is, I think we might be reintroduced to the, the principles of the free will, but from this time, it's from a cosmic perspective, right? And so if we ask, like, why didn't God just destroy Satan the second that he fell? Why did he cast him out instead of blow him up, right? I think you, can, you might be able to ask the same question about Adam and Eve. Like, they sinned. Let's start over, right? It, it seems like God is going to allow people to make bad decisions and is going to honor those bad decisions. And he's still going to work this to his good somehow. And we also know the end of the story, right? The end of the story is that Satan loses. So we also know that from Jesus, Satan has already lost. He's already lost. He's terminal, but he just hasn't fallen yet, right? So that's maybe something that we can hold on to, right? Mm -hmm. So, But you know, as a Christian, we have all these things. But as a Christian, we have one key thing that we have that's got power and our well against them. That is God and His Son and all those other Oh yeah. The Trinity. Yeah, we're gonna get to the good. We're gonna get to the good people here in a second. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's get through uh, this next little section, and then we only got about ten minutes, so we'll get through these next uh, couple pages pretty quickly. But um, Satan is maybe. Maybe. Satan is thought of as the originator of lies, murder, deception, false teaching, all these other things. And again, this is still within this framework. So if you disagree with this, with pieces of this, I would say good, right? For the next couple weeks after the session, we're going to be working toward how do we build our own answers for this. You remember the Russell Stover chocolate analogy? Mm -hmm. So for some people, this may be the toothpaste-y one, <laughs> right? But others, I think, I think they're going to be able to hold on to at least some of the principles. It makes sense of what the Bible says, that, that there is a battle to a degree, and that we, when we chose to bow our knee before the cross and give our lives to the Lord, we chose allegiance in this battle, right? We are... We are you know, Paul, we, we are fighting for, for, we are fighting against the principalities of darkness and all these other things. It's, these are seen as action words, right? So regardless of uh, what all can be said about this character, the biblical record holds that Satan is the adversary to God and all things good. There are others in rebellion, right? Demons could come from a Greek word meaning to divide, I think that makes sense. Second Peter 2, this is all in your book. Second Peter 2 says the angels, when they sinned, right? To sin is an extension of your will. They were also cast out. Jude 6, angels who did not stay within their authority left their proper dwelling and are being kept until judgment day. Revelation 12. Revelation 12 is the big like battle passage where you got a lot of like dragon, Satan is like attacking and stuff. Angels and Satan lost their place in heaven and now lead the world astray. So we went over this for a second. Do Satan and his followers help prove the free will defense? Maybe not help prove it, but maybe they're still operating within it. Okay. So did the devil make me do it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What do we think? Nope. No. No. Maybe. Yes. 
No. Depends. Depends. It depends. Well, flip a coin. <laughs> hey, hey, we know that there are people in the Bible in which Satan did have pretty much complete control over their mind, body, and body. So that is possible. Legion. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Here's what I would say. Admitting that Satan and, and dark forces, dark beings, can sometimes influence our thinking and behavior does not mean that they can determine our thinking and behavior. So even if we're being influenced, we still have choice. Yes. Right? So Adam and Eve could have said, no, why is a snake talking? Yeah, right. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. there, were, there were warning signs. Adam and Eve were still held responsible and punished. They still did it. Even though Satan was the villain who had tempted them, the right? So demonic influence may explain behavior, but it rarely, if ever, excuses it. So mm -hmm. could be, right? Judas turned himself to Satan. Ananias chose to lie. Mm -hmm. From what I can tell, anyone who is operating in a way that is uh, like demonic influence, at some point they, they, they tore down their walls, they released it, they allowed something to come in. Mm -hmm. So even if that, then there's still fault with the person. Mm -hmm. So demonic influence is different than demonic possession. possession. Yeah, so the way I would say it is uh, there's a difference between oppression and possession, right? So um, oppression is raw possession. Mm -hmm is letting it in. But, you yeah. know, it's out here, but possession would be in so, there. Because you hear about people, I mean, in our modern times, I mean, people committed absolutely horrible crimes and they don't remember doing it. Yeah. And so yeah. I think it's that demonic possession and then once he's had his way, it's like, yeah. now you need to suffer the consequences. I think I would be just as cautious with that as I am with divine retribution, mm -hmm. right? So it could be that this is going on, or it could be that someone uh, had a mental breakdown. If you're way on one side of the cosmic conflict, frame, you're going to say that, yeah, I mean, they, they were either working for him or he was working through them, right? But I think generally speaking, um, a lot of times the, the, the devil made me do it is usually an excuse. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to insane things like that, um, I mean, there's a lot of testimony from a lot of missionaries and a lot of people that's hard to refute about some nasty, nasty stuff that's done in the name of some nasty, nasty creatures. So, um, uh, uh, so I, I would say, you know, like I said, um, be, Balance. Ca be careful. Be careful with how you're handling that conversation and be careful to let a person who is truly evil and let themselves over to darkness off the hook because they, you know, they think that the devil made them do it or something like that. So I think regardless of where we stand on that, it's, it's important that we realize and recognize that we're in a battle and the battle is usually taking place within our hearts and usually for, I think, the normal every day is going to be in temptation to do wrong. Mm -hmm. you know, I think that's, that's more often, um, you know, hey, let me in, may not mean that we're going to give over our ability to choose to Satan, but hey, let me in could be, I'm going to make a really stupid decision mm -hmm. because I think I'm going to be able to get away with it. Yeah. yeah. Or even if I get caught, who cares? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. 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 You start blaming Satan on what you do, and then it's just like a excuse or a cheap reason why you yeah. can do what you want to do. That's, That's really good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like God yeah. using the, 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 the people that are really weak and people right. that you wouldn't think you would choose. Oh, yeah. Because you wanted to glorify yeah. Satan. So it's kind of like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sorry, Gideon. Yeah, or the. Yeah. the the few warriors against a lot, or hey, you're gonna go attack the the fortress of Jericho. Bring your horns. Yeah. Or even, or even okay. David, when we talked about this last night, David yeah. and Goliath. David and Goliath. Yeah. Absolutely. Daniel and the lions. Then. He's like a young kid go out there fighting this monster, and shooting monster and shooting mm -hmm. and you know. Yeah. Shooting giants. Right? Yeah, and the giant ended up being outmatched, yeah. right? Because God's so big. Which is a great parallel to there are others who are in obedience with God, right? And we see that Greek and Hebrew, the word for angel means messenger. Yeah. So Job 1, they're called the sons of God. Psalms 
calls them the holy ones. Hebrews 1 calls them spirits. Daniel, they're called the watchers. Colossians gives a bunch of titles. Thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, right? Daniel 10 and Revelation 12, angels wage war against the forces of darkness, fighting on the side of good and against corruption. Above all else, angels are a reminder that God is on our side. Ultimately, where demonic forces are workers of evil, angelic forces are laborers of good and work towards the victory of the Lord. I, these are two interesting case studies. I'm going to do them in reverse order because I want to end with a really cool one. Um, 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 5 through 8. Do you remember the context of this? Yeah? It's, it's the... Uh, he was on the run yeah. from Jezebel. So, when it's a, oh man, I could talk about this all night. It's one of my favorite stories. So, there's a drought in the land. God finally shows up, brings the rain, and then condemns all the false prophets of Baal. And there's this great victory for the Lord. And Jezebel says, you will be dead by this time tomorrow. And the prophet freaks out yeah. and runs the opposite direction, leaves his camp and keeps running. And as he lay down and slept under a broom tree, behold, an angel touched him and said, eat this. <laughs> and he looked and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar. Of, maybe it was his birthday. <laughs> and he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, arise and eat for the journey. The journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of the food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. So no matter what situation or circumstance we fight, we face in life, no matter what happens, the answer could be get a snack and take a nap. <laughs> right? Write that into your theology. I'm claiming that right now. All right. <laughs> the last case is Elisha, 2 Kings chapter 6. And this is, I mean, this will preach. 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 15 and 17. The people are surrounded and they're about to be killed, right? An evil king has showed up. He has judged that the king's going to do what the king's going to do and everyone in his wake is going to fall dead. When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant says, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He said, Don't be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha simply prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And they won. <laughs> and they won. So we spent, I don't know, 45 minutes on the bad stuff. But remember that Satan has already been defeated. He's a terminal patient, hasn't come to terms with his fate yet. And although we may be tempted and swayed, that our choices, our will still matters. What we do still matters and that we can choose him and that he is on our side. If there's a war that's raging, whatever that looks like, regardless of how that feels or what's happening in our lives, he is still on our side. We made the choice. If you haven't made that choice, come talk to me after class. We made the choice to follow and serve the Lord. To bow our knee to the kingdom of light. And most of that war is with peace and compassion and love. Our weapon is peace. The, the ammo is, is compassion, love, patience, gentleness. Practicing self-control, all those things. He is with us and we are on his side. So if you think in that terms, this really, it's a really good um, uh, military lesson in a lot of ways. To think that you are not just fighting for you know, the United States military, you're fighting for the kingdom of God as well. What if you went to that in the same kind of duty and dedication that you do your, your normal job? How often do you practice 
so that when the heat of the moment comes and you're in battle, then you automatically know to fall to your knees in prayer, to turn to the word, to seek after wise counsel and things like that. All right. So, yeah. yeah. I, I know that uh, this is kind of a difficult one. It's a challenging one. Uh, it's kind of a weird framework. And this was really just the introduction to it. Um, I've got books on books in, in my library talking about how this could work out and what this means and um, um, read through a book that talked about every time Satan showed up, every time the devil showed up in the Bible and then explained it. So in a lot of ways, this is an introduction. But to remember that on the other side, that we follow the Lord and we fight for the kingdom of righteousness. So next week, we're going to be uh, we're going to begin building our own um, uh, kind of personal theodicy. There's some divine, the, the last couple pages are about divine impassibility, which is does God have emotions? You can look through that. But um, as we go through this practical theodicy, next week we're going to be talking about lament, honesty, and uh, the ability to have and hurt in community. So I hope you all have a great week, and we'll see you next week.